Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining uh, the live today. Uh, I'm going to be your host today. I'm Oscar, uh, working in the developer relations team at Snap. Uh, today we will have Eric, engineer at Snap, talking about uh, creating AR experiences for custom locations. Uh, before we dive in, uh, as a reminder, next week we also have on June 20 a session from Mouseback on how they built uh, an exciting lens for the Snap Partner Summit. Uh, without further ado, Eric, can you please uh, introduce yourself and talk about what we'll be discussing today? Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm an AR engineer on the, the World AR team. So we focus on a lot of the technology involved with the, the back camera, the world facing camera. Uh, so we're doing a series of, of live streams this year because we we're trying to uh, promote our technologies and, and train our, our lens creators and get a lot of feedback too. It's, we really need a, you know, a across communication to really understand how to how to serve you better so the last live stream was um just like a basic overview of all the the world ar technologies and it was kind of like a survey course we kind of ran through everything within an hour and i told you i, I would uh do a deeper dive in, in each kind of tech stack um throughout the year and this one is based on custom locations so this is kind of uh, my specialty i focus a lot on the, the custom locations um uh, lens studio features and, and creating the crater lens, um, which I'll be covering in this course. So over the course of this next maybe 45 minutes to an hour, I'm going to be covering um, in depth um, what the, the crater lens is like, how to be on location, creating a custom location. Uh, and then I'm going to cover some of the uh, components and assets that you should be aware of when you're working in Lens Studio, in particular the, the location asset and the located at component. Um, if you've been using custom locations or custom landmarkers um, previously, you may have been familiar with the device location tracking component, but we're going to be um, educating you on the, the new workflows um, that we'd like to use, and we're kind of switching from the device location tracking component to the located at component. Both will work and both are in the template that I'll be covering, uh, but we'll just be teaching the more updated workflows. And following that, we'll be going into Lens Studio for the, the rest of the course. I kind of showed off the template and some of the um, high level features of it, but I really wanna kind of dig into the code and, and really um, versus you, the developer community, on, on how to use the template best for creating a custom location lens and also covering um, a bit of multiple location um, if you wanted to use that as well. And so all these links will be made available uh, on the, the YouTube video in the description, um, but starting from top to bottom, these are all links to our documentation or some type of videos. Um, I guess I'll call out quickly that there is this educational course um, that really covers in depth the workflows um, and you could take it at your own leisure and it, it you know, everything's kind of broken out with, with text and images. So I highly recommend that course. 
And um, I'll be stopping at each point and, and trying to get some, some real-time questions um, so we can kind of answer them at their um, most contextual situation. So uh, just ask away if you have any questions. Um, and before Lynn Studio, I'm gonna pop out. And before we actually start building a custom location lens, um, we actually have to create the data that we're going to use behind the scenes that you'll um, enter in an ID into Lens Studio and, and get access to it. Basically, you're going to be creating your location asset with this creator lens. And it's it's kind of a complicated process. We did create a, a walkthrough video here that I'll just be um, touching through some of the highlights on. And we do have our documentation. Um, but you know, it's a complicated process. You're, you're basically creating a computer vision data set. We really tried to simplify it as much as possible, um, make more of a everyday terminology, help with, with um, 2D and 3D graphics on what the workflow is like to help you make the best um, computer vision data set that, that can localize the best, that's e able to be tracked when a Snapchatter is using your custom location lens. Uh, but we're, we're going to spend some more time on it because, um, you know, your success rate of your location lens is, is really dependent on the quality of your, your computer vision data set. And so understanding what's what's works, what's not working and um, trying to use the lens in its testing modes to the best of your, your understanding is, is really my goal here. So helping you understand the technology behind the scenes and how to use our interface in the lens to uh, get the best uh, location asset basically out of it and have you return back to your workstation and, and lens studio is our goal here um, so this link is is available in documentation and um, the lens is, is currently available for lidar devices which is the the iphone pros um, you know we're, we're working on getting it into uh, cross-platform format which we'll be uh, promoting when that happens but um, the location I will say that the location IDs are public so if um, you know you are not able to access a LiDAR device but maybe through the, the lens creator community um, or some association you have you you might be able to get some IDs of some locations nearby to you but in either case if you're using the lens um, on a lighter device it's going to look something like this after you use the snap code to get access to it in snapchat and you'll be either creating a new location or you'll be viewing your existing ones and, and maybe testing them on location or maybe just trying to grab their ids that you can use them in lens studio there's also a, a settings page here that we'll, we'll cover as well but i'm just going to scrub through this video and kind of pick you through the highlights um so this is uh the settings page the default is these settings right here just leave them alone um if you're having issues with um trying to localize on your location and you're realizing things aren't going too out too well we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper into um what this works with what, what all this means but since we haven't kind of covered the lens right now um it's not really worth covering So the first step um, is creating the location mesh. So we, we broke this down into two steps. Uh, you can think of the location mesh as your visual guide in Lens Studio. Um, so there is like two scans. There's this mesh scanning and then what we're calling perspective scanning. The perspectives are really like your Snapchatter perspectives. They're, you have to think about where your Snapchatters are standing and this is where the computer vision tech is really coming in. So what we notice is that um, um, lens creators are really focused on this mesh creation because it's more visual um, and it looks like this is the most important part. But it's actually the it's guiding you in your scanning process, and it's actually going to guide you in Lens Studio um, to understand the locations, uh, the physical surfaces in your location, so you understand how to build your location experience around it. In this case, uh, I'm scanning this this line statue at the, the New York Public Library. But you could imagine if um, 
your lens, your your experience with either about navigation or information or or, or education and or um, entertainment, and you wanted to place some some three D content around this lion statue, and you have your content. Maybe it's it's amazing, and it, and you've built all your animations and your VFX and your your user interactions. But where do you place it um, in Lens Studio in the virtual world space to know where your your AR objects should be appearing, animating, um, or, or whatever their, their purpose is. Well, that's the point of this, what we're calling the location mesh. And um, first you have to scan the actual, something physical objects, think about your experience, think about the physical objects in this location, and maybe do some, some drawing in a notebook or some diagramming and figure out what's important. What do you need to recognize when you're back in Lens Studio? So in this case, the statue is come almost like a hero element for me. So I'm making sure I understand the front part of it and maybe the, the side part of it where people are walking by. And that's what I'm scanning right now. So we're, we're seeing this kind of grid pattern and we're seeing our UI down here and we're seeing a storage limit. Um, now this is a toggle. You can kind of switch between it to see what it's like to like spawn content on this mesh if, if this is important. You know, usually the the location mesh is used for visually understanding your, your location lens studio and you might use it to like place a, a better resolution mesh of the object if you're using maybe a photogrammetry process um, in in parallel with this uh, you might use the mesh as an occluder so that it, it um, helps you occlude your, your AR objects as they move behind it based on the, the viewing angle of the snapchatter or you may actually, for whatever reason, want to use it as a as a physics collider and might want to spawn content right on it. And it looks like it's growing on the, the physics on the physical object. And that's what we were doing here. Um, in either case, just be careful. This the storage limit is actually growing like the the real um, good data, the real the real data that we're really interested in is the computer vision data, which you don't actually see it. It's not really a mesh. Um, and this is kind of what we're, we're storing up our, our poses and our features um, to help us understand the images and where, where you're looking to see if we can recognize this later for localization. But you get just enough mesh that you need to like understand or whatever your use case is. If here we're using it as a, a physics collider mesh or if you want to use it as a cluder or just for visual placement, just really try to think about what the point of this mesh is and only create as much of it as you need to. After testing and you're happy, we're going to move on to the next scan. Um, and this has to do with what we're calling capture perspectives. And you're thinking Eric, about- I just have a question. I just, can yeah. I can I interrupt you for one question? I think sure. for the audience, are there any limitations to the size of the landmark uh, for the scanning? Yeah. We recommend that um, whatever the landmark is, like the central part of it that you're really interested, to keep it to within um, a 10 meter distance to you. So if it's a building, um, it can be bigger than 10 meters, but like the hero point, the area that you really are want the Snapchat to focus on, try to keep it to within the, the uh, you know a, a cubic volume of, of 10 meter by 10 meter. Uh, by 10 meter so it could be like like a building front the first floor of it uh, definitely uh, um, statues and sculptures and interesting landmarks or signs um, in front of houses and, and buildings um, okay. more like man-made structures things that um, not you don't want stuff that's like heavy with glass or like really shiny or reflective um, surfaces and you don't really want nature items like trees or bushes because they're gonna change over the seasons um, and they'll look different which means you won't be able to localize one of them so it's mostly for like uh, monuments and signs and statues and, and building fronts so thank you yep no good question um, as we move into the part two of the scan um, this is the really important one, and it's actually been running behind this, the scenes. We've actually been capturing perspectives while you're um, creating your mesh. It's just that you can think of you're creating your mesh, you have to get close. So the, the first part, the mesh is, is dealing with the LiDAR scanner and just rebuilding a 3D mesh that you can use. And LiDAR scanner range is something like five meters. So that's why we say start close, 
think about what type of mesh you need, and then you're going to move back, and then you're going to think about the perspectives of your users, the spec uh, perspectives of your Snapchatters. And usually they're not, you know, standing up close. If it's a building front or a a statue, they're not going to be like a, a few meters, just um, their face right in front of it. Usually they'll, they'll um, maybe there's a sign. You have, you have to think about how you're going to distribute your lens. Are you going to put like a snap code up, uh, maybe a flyer, a poster, or um, some type of advertisement or some type of way um, for them to know that, oh, I, I can use this location lens here. And usually where they're standing, they're by that that um, that distribution channel where, where you've decided to make them aware of your lens. So they'll probably be a little bit further back. And so here we're going to step away from the landmark or the, the structure, your point of interest. And we're going to start moving around where you think the Snapchatters will be looking. Normally when they first start your lens, they walk up and uh, they walk up and they, they're somehow aware of uh, that this lens is available here and they start looking around. That's the cat. That's the area. That's the where you're standing that you want to be. And then you want to look and you want to kind of scan your your viewing range around the, the landmark or the, the point of interest. So here you can see we have a different kind of scanning interface down here at the bottom. Yes, we do have like a meter kind of growing. And we have a min and a max now. So we have a certain amount of perspectives we need to capture to like in that we feel is our best shot at trying to localize this lens for you. And once this, we pass this minimum threshold, which we may have already done in the, the create mesh because we started capturing already. It's called a combined scan, which we'll go back to the settings and take a look at that. But this done button will appear when we pass minimum. And we, we um, want you to try to push push as much as you can and we have a limit because we have to consider our, our file sizes and um, right now we're looking at a visualization of what these perspectives look like in this um, the perspective visualization so that's these kind of little um, thumbs up um, icons when you when you get close to one it'll maximize and it'll make this big one and as you create new ones you can see that um, We'll have this big kind of icon that's facing you. It's letting you know, yes, you've captured this perspective. A perspective is a place of standing, a location, and an orientation. Where are you looking at? So hopefully, you know, these are standing points, locations where your Snapchatters are most likely to be standing and then oriented, looking. Where is their device pointing? And that's why we have this kind of cone, this um, animated texture of arrows in this kind of conal re, um, uh, volume oriented toward where you're looking. So this is where you're standing, um, you know, pushed in front of you a little bit so you can see it. And then a kind of an orientation of this, these arrows and that, you know, they get noisy and they're loud. We just want you to see the ones that are right in front of you and we shrink them down so that you can kind of see all the perspectives that you are generating. So you want to move that phone. You want to keep walking. Uh, we generate usually a perspective about every um, 10 centimeters. If there isn't one there, if the phone has moved a distance of 10 centimeters, you know, we'll create a new one or if there's been a big change of orientation. So try to walk around and think about where your snap chairs will be standing. And I should switch over to the, the feature view in a second. Oh, here we go. I'm going to pause it for a second. So here's a different view. It's not focused on where we are standing and looking. It's looking at the end result. What are we looking at? So all the feature dots that are sitting on the physical surface that we are, um, our perspective is looking at. So between these two views, hopefully they'll, they'll give you a really good understanding of your perspectives that you've captured in this second part of the scan. Um, once you're happy with the coverage area, you think you've, you have enough perspectives um, to help your Snapchatters localize at the beginning of the lens, there's really only one more part I would really want to focus on, um, and then maybe I'll do the settings page and I'm, I'm getting a little long, but this is a very important part of the process. I want to spend a little bit of extra time with this. Um, lens testing. This is very important so once you are done creating your two sets of data your location mesh and your perspective set here we can test so we see them both together we see our location mesh on the object and we see our perspectives sitting around the the point of interest 
and you can test either your features or your content. So this is like seeing your perspectives and your features together, your CV data set. And notice we kick it off. We start like trying to destabilize the tracking. So we turn it off and then back on and we see if tracking can track again, if it can localize. And if it's not localizing, it'll say, oh, I'm having issues. I can't localize and you won't see anything. Or if it is able to, there, the, the, the graphics will come back on and you're saying we have recognized your features. We've recognized your, your computer vision data set. So you're supposed to walk around um, where your Snapchat, where you think your audience is, your Snapchat will be and see if at every different kind of viewing angle perspective that the tracking can be recognized, can be localized. So here, as I look down, we can't see anything. So we didn't record our perspectives in that way but that's looking at the floor. So I don't think it's that important. And then you can switch the content and you can see what it's like if you used your, your location mesh as a uh, physics collider. And I'm just um, drawing my finger across the screen. So ultimately you, you name it and you will get an ID back. And this is what you're going to use in your location asset in Lens Studio. And you could view your um, locations. I think I... So here's me just clicking, going back to the home screen, the first part of that lens and going into view your locations. Then you can click on each one um, and do and you'll go back into lens. Awesome. And I'll quickly return to the settings page and see if there's any questions. So our default settings is this combined where meaning the scans are combined. When we start off creating our location mesh, we will secretly start capturing our perspectives to try and help you building perspectives um, all the way through. If for whatever reason um, you like burn through all your perspectives during your, your mesh gathering, for whatever reason you need to create a large mesh and it's really um, impacting your your quality of your your perspectives your computer vision site you could separate them too um, it's just not our preferred style but we give it up to you if you need to really spend a lot of time and if you do need to make a big mesh we do have a medium size it's something about four megs but you could also max it out and you're allowed to go up to an eight megs uh, mesh size if you separate them out the meter um, for create mesh will be focusing on the mesh not the perspectives and then also here's our min and our max. Uh, min, it, it's not really that useful, I'll just leave that alone. Um, there might be some situations where you need to go lower, but it doesn't really you know, make sense to go up. It's, it's just the minimum. So max, if you really need to push it, you can push it up to max and you'll, you'll be allowed to create more of these features um, and poses um, our perspectives. So it's really, uh, you need more mesh, you can separate it, max out your mesh. If you're really hitting a perspective limit, you can max out. And some new features, if, if you like want to make your tracking work well in the daytime and the nighttime in different lighting conditions, if some things have changed or um, for a reason you need to combine scans, you can do this incremental scanning. So you create one scan, you view it, and if you localize, you will have this plus button to create another scan and we'll combine them for you and create a new one. And we suggest um, maximizing that about three or four times because the scans will get diluted. But two to three times and you'll be able to get like a 24 hour localization situation going really well. And um, that's it for the creator lens and um, the video walkthrough up here really kind of covers a lot too and take your time you just have to experiment a lot try to make a lot of locations like right at home or at your work where you don't need to walk because um, it takes a lot of um, experience to, to get a feel for it so i'll take a quick pause for questions currently i don't see any questions but if anyone has any questions any questions please drop them in the comment section um Cool. Yeah. Um, so I am going to talk a bit about some assets and components we're going to use in Lens Studio. This is our documentation. So the first thing you're going to end up doing is as a resource, you're going to be creating a location asset. I'll, I'll walk you through that. And you're basically um, 
it's just a resource it's going to be a file that's going to sit in your project and you're going to have to enter in an id so you're going to have to go back to your creator lens or if somebody is offering you up a location you just need to get access to that id and the located at component is going to be really important in our workflow again we, we um we're using the device location tracking component um, we still are going to be using device tracking and i'll cover that but you're going to want to use a located at component at your your scene object for each location um, and it's very easy to do multiple locations within one lens if you wanted to i'll make a note that you do need it connected to a location asset because that's what we're going to be trying to localize on and these events are really important so on found meaning we're able to localize for that first frame okay the snapchatter is where you want them to be we found where they are we found your location now run your content that you're going to run um on ready means we, we've downloaded stuff on lost is um we've lost tracking I'm not going to use that too much and if it's aired out for whatever reason you might want to listen to this and just like reset um some parts of your lens in case an error happens and on track means it's ready it's downloaded it's trying to track uh, i'll show that we we ha do have this um template guide um we do need to update it because this, this is a, a a previous iteration so the the educational course is following the new project and it's much more in depth so i would recommend the the educational course right now over the template pro, uh, documentation but we will update this soon and this is what the educational course looks like so um if there's uh, any questions on that little step over you can you can ask them otherwise um i'm gonna spend the remainder of the course in lens studio we had a question but i'm not sure i, I asked for more details let's see if you understand it better than me it's is it possible to use the mesh with a portal lens uh but to me to me this could be combined together i don't see any problem do, do you so i asked for more details to get but uh eric do you have any thought on that um a portal from like you're currently at one custom location and the portal's like looking into another um you could combine the portal template with our custom location template and combine the features with them uh, but yeah I, I think i would need um I, th I think that's pretty i think that's probably likely it's like you're at a location it recognizes the area and then basically you have a portal and you see inside mm. the portal i guess but yeah. it's possible technically it's possible Oh, yes. Yeah, you, you could um, take your lessons that you've learned from the, the portal uh, template and bring them over into the custom location template and combine the features. So basically, it's like only when the Snapchatter localizes on the custom location that you've created, will this portal effect, will this portal experience be run? Um, then yes, definitely. You can do that. Thank you. Cool. So this is um, our custom location template. I'm just going to kind of run through the object hierarchy, um, just show you some where the important scripts are in the resources. And I will take a note that my Lens Studio might look a little different. I did open up the middle um, view because I'm actually going to try and look at the scripts right in Lens Studio. Normally, I don't do this. I, I work in VS Code and I would recommend you do too. But um, since most of these tutorials are for beginners, you're probably looking at your code right in Lens Studio. So I'm going to do that as well. And I have my inspector over here instead of being um, here to have more room for the code. So those are the only kind of changes I have here. But um, as you look through this, this template, you, there's some helper scripts. For, this has to deal with animation. This has to be, deal with like um, behaviors like UI events. So we won't be looking at those. This is our main camera right here. And if I look at the inspector, you can see that we have a device tracking component, which is vital. Um, it is set to world. This is what enables our, our native tracking in either AR Core for Android or AR Kit for iPhone. But you do need um, this component with the camera component to function. What I was talking about was the device location tracking component, which we will not be using. Um, but the template code does work 
So if you do you like these um, older styles with the DLTC, then by all means you can do it because I'm going to show you the code that is um, looking for located at components and device location tracking components. Um, this orthographic camera is for our UI. So hint text and location graphics, the 2D stuff. So you can um, look in here. I'm not as concerned about this area because that's more the, the user interface. And this scene object contains all of our, our custom locations, um, scripts and content. So I'm just going to jump down to resources real quick. And some things I am interested in here are the location asset. And if I click over to inspector, here's the location ID. We just entered in an ID for a publicly ava available, um, it's like an SPS sculpture. And so that's why it looks like kind of like a chair, but it, we just want you to see what it looks like when you enter in a, a real ID and there's a real location downloaded. So this is the location mesh. You do not see the CV data. You do not see all those kind of perspectives and features. Um, those are run behind the scenes. The mesh is for you for a visual aid. And so just notice the location type is custom and there's this ID here. And if you wanted to, you could create your own location asset of type custom and it will ask you for the id but in this template it just asks you to replace the id here um, the only other thing in resources is here's the scripts i will be working with and basically the the, the main one the one that i'm going to be spending my time with is this status controller script so as i look through the objects here i'm going to switch over to the inspector um, we have this location asset information script and it just connects to the location asset, which is already connected up for you. Don't need to mess with that. This is your marker tracking. Um, for you, when you wish to publish your lens, um, you will need to um, have a, a marker connected to this so that our moderation team can run your lens and approve it. So this is a big step. It's not really related to um, how custom locations works. It's just for you to get your approval of your lens. And the status controller script is a big script. It might be, let me just see if it's shrunking up and you know, it won't be able, it'll look something like this. If it doesn't look something like this, just make sure you turn on advanced and you might you know, be able to see the behind the scenes connections um, that you might want to mess with. Um, this is a script I'll be looking at quite a bit. And then here we have our content. So this is showing the location mesh. If you swap out the ID, it'll download and show you a new mesh. Um, and normally it's for looking around and understanding Oh, this is what I was doing, right? So I can understand this is my view. This is like the, the chair is facing this way. And I know what um, my AR content, where to place it spatially around this center point of interest. In this case, it was a, a chair sculpture. But if I had downloaded my lion statue ID, you would see that the lion statue mesh. Now, when you're done building, you're going to use a lot in Lens Studio. Um, and when you build the lens and you're going to like go on location to test it, to make sure it works right before you submit it, you know, you might turn this off. This might not be part of your, your lens at runtime. It might just be during your development experience in lens studio. Um, or you might, after done placing everything, you might like put on an occluder mesh, or you might, um, put on a physics collider that can read this mesh if you want to do uh, user interactions on it. In any case, um, the location mesh has multiple purposes in your workflow and all of them are kind of optional. This is just the first one that's kind of mandatory, which is um, it's used as a visual aid. And then here's our content. You know, these little blue creatures that, that um, have animations. Um, so, and if you, oh, perfect. So if I, I, down here on, this is like, my one set of AR content. So if there was multiple custom locations, we would have multiple of these. You can think of, oh, I have one custom location. So I'm gonna have one scene object that represents that location in the content that will be turned on when we, we find the location. 
So here we have our located at component and you can see that we've connected our location asset to it and the contents underneath it. And this script is interesting. Uh, we're not really, there's not really um, stuff in the script. I mean, I can click over and it's really just this, this enum, this um, value that you can change that will allow you to test the um, lens in Lens Studio. So for example, this is what it looks like when the location was found. But let's say if we're like walking up to the location and we've determined via with GPS that the, the user, the Snapchat is far away. Well, this is what it's gonna show to them. So the UI changes and if you had any content, it would change too. And parts of the, the educational course in our documentation cover how to have fun with, with the UI and swap out the text and graphics, um, but I'm not covering that. But anyway, this is what it looks like if it's loading. Um, if we had an error, uh, an error that on error event was called, and if you're getting really close, and if the location was found, we had tracking successful, and now we represent or we present our our main AR experience. So this is great for in editor testing. Ultimately, once you're really happy in editor, and I will say we we are improving our in editor tools. I can't talk about exactly what that means, but you will have a much better experience down the road. Um, but once you do your testing in Lens Studio, you do want to push to device. You want to get your lens on your phone and go back on location. So if you're new to this and you're testing a lot, pick a location that's very close and use the creator lens a lot to get comfortable with creating a, a solid um, location asset. And then you know, have fun in Lens Studio, build your experience, and then push to device and go actually see if, if you can start tracking on location. We have a question in the chat uh, about, can we use also this for indoor, like at your home? If you wanted to oh, yeah, scan, absolutely. With, would it work within your house with somehow good accuracy, it's like treasure mm -hmm. games for kids? Okay. Oh yeah, and I would, it's a great use case. Um, we are working a lot with in-home use cases and we're um, um, developing unique technology, I will say, for in-home. So you can think of custom locations as outdoor, like statues and, and building fronts and um, house uh, uh, fronts or, or back of houses or schools or um, anything you can think of that has like, it's all about like unique visual features. So you can't just have big empty like white walls um, but anything that has, is visually unique and distinct to your eyes will usually be very visually and unique to computer vision data sets. Um, and indoor use cases are, we're exploring a lot like games and um, as, you, as, as you just mentioned, are, are, would be a lot of fun. And, and indoor usually has a lot of different, you know, visual characteristics, different furniture and different items in a room and it actually works um, really well in house. Cool. So let me check the time real quick. So I have less than 10 minutes or so because we have to leave some time for QA. So let me kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts here. Um, so here we have a scene object that has a located at component that is connected to one location asset. And that's the most basic custom location lens. If you wanted multiple ones, you just duplicate this one or the easiest workflow on you is you duplicate this and you need to create a new location asset and just connect it to this located at component. So you would have two located at components, each one pointing to a different location asset and your lens could potentially work in more than one location. But for now, we're just doing one. And if we jump back over to the status controller um, and we look down here, it's this custom location. So where it says location content in the location controller, these two are referencing this right here, which is our, our one location, our one located at component. And if we look in our code editor, our um, up here, script editor, the all these, this first part is like generating this user interface that's being seen over here. And so you can see lo location content is, right here, right? And um, we're gonna reference this later on along with the rest of these. So some interesting things to focus on 
is this beginning part here that's going to run. This basically goes through all the scene objects and your, your object hierarchy up, up here, and it hunts for any type of device location tracking component or located at component. And we'll throw them into our collection so that we can listen for their events later on. These on location found, um, or on location, if you want to know that you know something's downloaded, but the really important one is on location found. So what's happening here is that um, we're creating an object here that has two collections in it. Let's collect up all of our device location track components. Let's collect up all of our located at components. These are just empty arrays at the moment. But here we're um, looking at how many uh, root objects. So if I shrink this all up, we just have four root objects right now. But as you modify this template, that might change. But basically we just go through each one. So get root object of list out, start at zero. So grab this one, this one, this one, and then that one. And um, we call this register components function. And we pass in we call it twice, once for DLTC and once for located at. So we pass in the collection, the object that we're starting to search at, and what type of component that we're looking for. And um, as we pass those all in, what we do is we, whatever object we passed in, we call this get components on it. So whatever components are right on that scene object, so if I click on this one here, if we ever get to this scene object, we see that there is a located at component on it. And so this one would work, but the others would return zero, wouldn't have any of these. But if it does, we basically take the collection that we're looking for, either DLTC or located at, based on the component that we're looking for, and we push that component that we just found onto it. And then we go through each child scene object and do the same thing. So it's a recursive function call. So basically we go through each root object and say, hey, let me know if there's a device location tracking component. If so, pop it onto our collection or push it. Um, and then go through all your children and basically do the same thing until we go through all of our scene objects. So now we know which located at components and device location tracking components are in the scene. Um, and then a whole bunch of functions are defined and all at the bottom here is, okay, let us bind this function to the update event. And the update event is just this little loop. It's called as, as often as possible. You can think of it as maybe being called 30 to 60 um, times a second based on, you know, how strong the device is and um, how, how complicated your lens is. But so updated hint state um, is going to be important because that's called every update event. And um, right when we start off, we initialize. So we call this initialize function. And so basically it's just setting some graphics and it's going through. So remember these collections of um, components I've found? Well, we're going to go through each one and we're going to go basically subscribe to their their events. Um, so DLTC is a little is using callbacks and located at components are using events, which are the more modern form of callbacks. But um, since we're not really focusing on the DLTCs, let's just look at located at. So basically for every located at component we found in our scene, <laughs> We have our, our four main events that we're interested in on found, on lost, on ready, which means we've downloaded and we're ready to go. And on error, but our download failed. We need to do something. We don't want to have a bad experience for our user. And the big one that we're focusing on is on found. So you can add and remove method um, calls to an event when that event gets fired. Here we're just adding this method so on location found um, and then we're going to do a few more lines of code of execution but let me just show you on location found is a, a function down here and this is what's going to get called when one of the located at components gets found gets um, triggered gets localized um, cool so to wrap up initialize 
Um, this is kind of um, what we're doing is saying toggle content to false. This is like the big thing if you need to like modify this template. So toggle content is just turning stuff on and off. So that means this whole thing right here is turned off to begin with because we didn't find the location. And when we do find a location, we just turn it on. And once it's turned on, all of its sub objects like initialize and start. And if they're playing animations or, or whatever, it'll be, kick off. So what toggle content is doing is whatever status you pass in true or false, it'll take whatever our location content is and set it to turn it on or off true or false. So this location content script that location content is really um, this right here, this location content. And if I say, what are you pointing to? It's this custom location group right here. That's why it's being turned on and off. So if I go all the way up here to all of our like initial input variables, here we have our, our input of type scene object and we're calling location content. And when we reference it later on, we just say script.location content. So if you needed more than one location, custom location, not only do you kind of duplicate this thing, but you need another variable too. Like this is my location content for this custom location. And this is my content for that custom location. So just a heads up if you're thinking about doing um, multiple uh, custom locations. In any case, this is turned off when we initialize. And let's look at when that um, on found happens. So a lot of this is, is like during different um, events being called or whatever, like how should we update the UI? And that's what a lot of these functions are doing. Um, and the big one is, is happening right here. Um, that, that update event, that method that's happening with update has to do a lot with like just um, being aware of what's happening with different location events are being called and what have you. But this method is the big one. This is like, we wait until this happens. Um, and you don't really have to pay attention. We we're, this is like it's setting the UI and stuff, but this right here, add your own custom logic here. So this is just toggle content true, you know? So like, um, if we localize, everything's great. All that happens is the scene object turns on and these, these sub scene objects just do what they're going to do. They're going to listen for user input, play their animations. We're, we're good to go. You know, the Snapchat is ready to have their experience. The one last thing I'll mention is I did um, just write these little comments before we started. So on function initialize that, you know, this function gets called right at when we start running. If you did have um, multiple located at components, instead of doing this, you would probably comment this out. And then for each um, one, remember I said up above, you, you have different input variables. You'll say, okay, for on found this event, you'll, you probably want a different method uh, for each one. So you can recognize which on found is happening. So you might want to go down here and be like, oh, okay, I need function for like on location maybe the first one that was found i'm gonna do my custom logic here and for function on location the second one the second one found you know you're gonna do some other logic for that location if you're doing multiple locations then you have two right you, like you can distinguish one from the other and let me just copy one so it might just look like instead of all this right here, you, you'd probably throw that out and you might have something like script that like location of one, like on found dot add. You might say, okay, this is the method. When this location fires its on found event, then we're going to be, you know, off to the races with that air content. Or if the second one is found, like if there's two store shops next to each other and you have a location for each and you don't know which one the stat chatter registers on, you're like, okay, this, this is a restaurant and this one's a, uh, like a grocery store and I have different content for each. And that's how you distinguish between the two. Just a question we add, uh, sorry to interrupt, just in case. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for can you use scans from the for, from from third party applications like Polycam that mm -hmm. can be exported uh, in SVG and used as custom lens marker mesh, or do we have to go through the the official lens? Um, well, you have to use the official lens to get the computer vision data set, but you and then you'll get some type of location mesh. And if this location mesh isn't a high enough quality. Um, and you want to use like a photogrammetry process or, or a third party tool that gets you a much better quality mesh with a texture on it. Um, that's awesome. And you can bring it in here. You know, you can import in your, your photogrammetry mesh. So you might be on location and yes, you will have to use the crater lens. Um, because the crater lens is the only way to get that location ID is to create that computer vision data set. Um, that you connect to your location asset. That's essential. And you want to create enough of a location mesh that you can understand what you're looking at in Lens Studio. And then when you're on look back, when you're still on location, use your photogrammetry tool, use your polycam, what have you, and create, you know, an amazing high res mesh and then export that out, you know, OBJ, FBX, um, whatever your 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 favorite file type is bring that into lens studio and then make it a scene object and, and position it and then position it relative to this location mesh and then you can have access to your your high res uh, polycam mesh in here too but you, you still need to use the the crater lens you're just now creating using the polycam in addition on location does that make sense thank you yeah this Cool. We have a few minutes left. And um, so that was my in-depth whirlwind run through. Hopefully it all made sense. I'm really interested in feedback. We have a lot of really cool updates coming down the pipe for the creator lens, um, for lens studio, for testing, um, for note taking, for improved meshes. And um, so you know, we're really interested on, on your feedback on this current workflow, what, what you would like to see improved, what would be useful to you. And uh, we're, we're always trying to create better products for you. Awesome, awesome. I'm looking. If anyone has any question, please ask them now. I can't see any question yet. Uh, but if anyone has one, let us know before we close today live stream. Yeah. And I'll definitely say, um, if you're watching this later on after the live stream, post up your comments too, uh, for any questions, comments, suggestions, and we'll be, um, addressing those and, and reading them as well. And we'll respond back to you. Awesome. I think, I mean, I don't see any question, so let's just give it a couple more seconds. Uh, oh, here we go. Just one. Sorry for jumping in. Is it yet possible to export the custom mesh? Uh, yes, we can. You can export the location mesh. Um, let me. I, I just like that's a very good call. We, that is available now. So this is see this export is OBJ. So the the process would be first you create your location asset, right? Let me let me pop my inspector over and. You create your location asset. It'll ask you for your ID. It's going to be custom. Your next step is you're going to have to create a location mesh. And this location mesh is going to say, Hey, I'm a render mesh. You can pop me on a scene object, but what location am I supposed to connect to? And then you just connect the location asset to it. That's why you see this location mesh is referencing this one too. But what's really awesome with location mesh is you can export as an OBJ file and then you can bring it into your content editor of choice, Blender, Maya, what have you, and edit the mesh or add to it and bring it back in. So you could, you know, if you really love another content package or have some really advanced mesh editing you want to do, including you might want to incorporate your photogrammetry mesh right into your location mesh as, as one big um, file, which is awesome too. Do it in your content package, whatever you have to do. Uh, delete some polygons, add some polygons, incorporate the photogrammetry mesh, and then export the whole thing out and bring it right back into Lens Studio. And it's 
and it's because it was made with the crater lens um you know it's try it's um coordinate space is all synced up and you bring it back it'll be right back um where it's at by the way the another viewer danny that we we know quite well uh, said in capital letters no way so i think you are <laughs> You are, uh, and, and same for the one that asked the question, Ethan, uh, Ethan uh, said, great feature, been waiting for this. So I think it's a very uh, exciting feature for the community. Uh, actually, Danny is asking, can we swap the location mesh with an adjusted version of the OBJ file? But I, I don't um, think so, right? From what you said earlier. Well, no, you, you, but you would have a, a regular mesh resource. And as long as you bring it back in, Um, you know, you would, you would, I don't, I don't have an FPX file in this project, but as long as you bring, you know, you can export out your location mesh, do what you need to do, right? Export it, um, export it out of that package out of as OBJ, FBX, or some other file format, bring it back into Lens Studio and just have another scene object, um, that has, a, a render mesh visual on it and make sure the position zeroed out scale is one. And when you connect your new updated personal mesh to it, it'll be in the correct, perfect location. Perfect. All right. I think uh, we're getting there. I think everyone is saying thank you a lot to both of us. Uh, but actually, it's thank you to Eric, really, <laughs> for preparing and presenting this uh, great workshop. Is there anything else, Eric, you needed to, to discuss or to present before we wrap it up? No, I, I, I'll just reiterate that any feedback back to our group um, is huge. So even if it's just comments in the YouTube or, or anything, eventually we'll be trying to build better um, communication channels with our dev community. But, you know, we're just, this is our big effort as the, the World AR team to start reaching out. All right. So any awesome. feedback you have is great. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Thank you again, everyone, for attending. And we see you next week. Oh, before we close it up, I just remembered uh, we actually have a new uh, learning uh, 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 platform hub on the on Snap website. Um, the URL is um, I'm thinking very hard. ar.snap.com/learn. Uh, uh, it's our new learning hub uh, where you can check out different resources uh, and learn more uh, um, about Lens Studio. So remember to check this out. Also, again, next week there's going to be a new session presented by uh, Mouseback and how they created a, a lens they um, did for the Snap Partner Summit. Um, and yeah, thank you again for joining and we see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.